Hey there. I am Alejandro, the pastor of Calvary Chapel Tracy, and this is my wife, Nikki. Hello. And if you're watching this video, it means that you were recently saved or that you want a refresher in the basics of our faith. And I want to encourage you, these videos are really to bless you and to help lay that foundation of our faith. So please enjoy and uh, be blessed. Know that we're always praying for you and you can reach out at any time. Um, you can find us on our website, calvarytracy.org. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Calvary Chapel Tracy, or on Instagram at Calvary Tracy. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. God bless. God bless. All right, well, welcome back to the second video uh, for you. We're really excited that you have received the Lord, that you're growing in your faith. And uh, what I want to do today in this video is just give you more about the basics, kind of practical stuff of what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a Christian. We'll go into where we were last week on Romans, or last video on Romans 12, and finish up that uh, topic on spiritual gifts and what it means to serve God. And then we'll go into a little bit on the kind of basis of the Christian life, the, the kind of the things we devote ourselves to, the things that are the building blocks of a mature, growing, um, walking by faith kind of Christian life. This might all be new to you. And that's okay, um, but that's why the video exists, <laughs> to introduce you to all these things. Um, before I do that, like I did last time showing you a resource on Blue Letter Bible, I want to show you another resource as we get started. So let me uh, shut myself off here. Um, this is what's called the Calvary Chapel Association website. That's what we are as a church. We're a Calvary Chapel. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great churches out there, um, but for, for now, I guess I just want to introduce you to who we are. Um, and there's a couple things here. You can go to what's called the church locator, and you can type in any zip code. Like, let's say we are going down to Southern California for a chance. Um, this is where my family lives. And look, there's all the Calvary Chapel churches that you could find. Um, to visit uh, for a day or, or something. Um, what if we're staying up here closer to home? There we are, Tracy. And here's all the Calvary Chapel churches in this area. So there's that's a really cool thing if you ever move or you're, you know, have family outside of town and you wanna encourage them to go to a good Bible teaching church. Another thing that you have here, which I think might be even better for you as a new believer is under resources, the teaching library. If you go to the teaching library, you go here to buy uh, chapter or by book, or you can go by teacher. I'll go by teacher for now. What you have is loaded up all these different career pastors. These guys have been teaching the Bible for decades and decades, each of them teaching verse by verse through the Bible. Um, Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel, uh, look at how many sermons they have of him, 631 of his teachings that you can just pull up and look at any book of the Bible and get his teachings on them. That way, no matter what you're reading on your own or no matter what you're interested in studying, you have trustable uh, or trustworthy uh, teachers to go to and listen to their sermon, um, enjoy one of their sermons. Uh, you may grow a lot. Let's go to John. Here it is. And you can just click on it and uh, get right into it from there. And then there's other resources, like I said, on Blue Letter Bible, um, which we looked at last time. So let's go to Romans. All right, here we are in Romans again. Uh, like I said, we're going to finish off that little topic there on the gifts of the Spirit. So what we have here, Romans 12, we jump down to verse 3. It says this, For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Just kind of staying humble, right? You don't want to think so great about yourself. Uh, and then it says, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, remember, we talked about this last time. It's by faith you're saved, right? But then as you grow as a Christian, this is talking to people who are already saved, who are already Christians. God deals with us and deals to us measures of faith, measures of giftings as he's about to go on into so that we can grow in his 
word, grow in his, our relationship with him, and grow in service to him. That way we can be a, a functioning part of the church, a functioning part of his body. And it goes on saying, For as many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Right? You have arms, you have legs, you have eyes. Uh, the same idea for the church. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we have this deep connection, just the same way your hands are connected to your arms, to your torso. We have a connection in Christ, in the church, that you're a part of now. You've been taken out of the world and you've been placed into the church. It's, it's, it's this new thing that you have, a new community, a new fellowship to be enjoying. And in that, it says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So remember, a measure of faith, uh, 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 gifts according to the grace that is dealt to us. This isn't talking about saving faith or saving grace. This is the, the faith that we grow in as we walk with God or the grace of God as we begin to serve him by his empowering. This is after being saved kind of stuff. And we have gifts differing according to the gifts that are given to us. Let us use them, it says. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, you hear prophecy and you're probably thinking future telling, right? Uh, crystal ball kind of stuff, or a, or a tarot card reading, or some reading the palms. That's not at all what scripture encourages or teaches. The Old Testament prophets, sometimes they would foretell the future. They would speak about future things, which we call prophecy. Uh, but most of the time, they were just hearing from God and then speaking that message out. Think about Jonah, who went uh, to the city of Nineveh and preached to them. He spoke God's word to them, and then they repented. Or Isaiah, who preached to the kings, or Jeremiah. These guys, these prophets, they spoke, to, they spoke up for God. They were his mouthpieces, his voice boxes. Well, the same thing for us now in the church. We need people who have a prophetic gift in the sense that they know how to take scripture and place it right into your life. It's a really encouraging thing when you're going through some sort of trial or troubling moment and someone just has that perfect verse for you. And they, they bring it out and they explain it to you and they foretell, um, not the future, but they, I think it's called forth telling is the way we kind of break it up. Foretelling the future sometimes, but most of the time, forth telling, just bringing forth to you the word of God as it's meant to be. Uh, someone might have a, a particular word of encouragement or word of a wisdom for you, uh, some way that they have to tell you something from God. And it may be things you already know or that we all know, things out of scripture that we've read a thousand times, but the way they can bring it up in the right moment, man, it's a gift for someone to be able to take the correct teaching of scripture and bring it to the correct moment that someone needs forth telling. Then it says, uh, or ministry, which is service. Let us use it in our ministering. Some of you are just great hands. You know, you, you can get up, you can do something, you can put your effort into it, your work into it, make something good out of something that, uh, would have stressed other people out. Uh, we need people who are just servants. Just worker bees who get things done, you know? How many times has a church needed to set up a thousand chairs for some event or, uh, you know, you do the, the VBS for the kids and you turn the whole church into a big uh, children's ministry event? Well, at the end, we need to clean up, you know? Uh, there are people who just need to serve and they could be standing at the door and greeting people as they enter the building, making sure they feel welcome. It could be making sure that the kids are taught their scriptures. It could be serving uh, in the parking lot, making sure everybody gets a, a parking space and not having to, you know, park a, a mile away. And then when they walk up to the door, they realize there was three open spaces there. You know, that's that's not fun. So there's some people who just need to, to minister, to serve. Then it says, he who teaches in teaching. Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm teaching the Bible to you. Uh, that's my main gift. That's one of the reasons why the Lord's called me into being a pastor. But there are other teachers in the Bible who... Uh, uh, or the other teachers in the church, children's ministry teachers who teach the kids the scriptures. There's a youth uh, ministry. We want to teach the youth the scriptures. There's a teaching in the sense of uh, biblical principles. Every once in a while, we'll do a uh, Dave Ramsey class 
Financial Peace University so we can teach Christian people how to do uh, Christian things with their money. It shouldn't be that uh, as you walk with God that you're broke when you're just not budgeting properly, when you don't know how to pay your bills, when you don't know how to take care of yourself with insurance. I mean, let's just teach people things they need to know so that they're taken care of. It doesn't mean everybody's going to be rich, but at least we know what to do with what money we have. There are teachers in the body. And it says, he who exhorts in exhortation. There's someone out there who's just really good at encouraging people. They can see how someone's gifted. They can see how someone's doing well, and they can just come alongside them, come to befriend them and just encourage them to go even farther. It also is an exhort exhortation when you maybe have to correct someone. You see them doing something wrong. You see them, you know, maybe preaching a false thing that's not scriptural. Sometimes somebody's gifted to exhort them to better teaching, to better practices outside of the sin or the problems that they're getting themselves into. He who gives with liberality. Some of us are blessed to give more than others. You know, uh, for some people, you know, giving $5 breaks their back. For others, giving 500 doesn't make a difference. Whoever can give should give. In, uh, and the reality is that everybody can give, but it just depends on the heart of the person of what they'll give. And may it all be unto the Lord. May it be with a cheerful heart, um, something you'll never really hear us talk about at the church is how much money we need because we don't really care. We, we, we trust that God's going to bring the money that the church needs. Another thing that you might be able to give is give services. There's a friend of mine who is a mechanic and something he gives to the people he loves is free mechanic services and he or gives discounts at his shop just because he's trying to give to people uh, to bless them. There are others who give in different ways. One of the things that we do as a church to give and to give liberally, to give with just great generosity is we do the uh, Operation Christmas Child every year where we get shoeboxes together of gifts uh, for Christmas gifts and, and you know pencils and, and coloring books and little toys and maybe some little Bible things. And we send them off to who knows where. Thousands and thousands of churches do this. And what it does is it allows missionaries to show up with a gift and then the gospel presentation. That's one way that we give as a church. So let's learn to be givers. Then it says, he who leads with diligence. Now I'm leading the church as the pastor, but there are some people who lead the children's ministry, others who lead the men's and women's ministries, people who lead our mission trips. That's just a gift that God can give some people. Maybe you're a leader in the workforce outside of church. How could God take those lessons you've learned and turn them into church mentality, church ways. Some things won't compute because you don't run the church like a business, right? Um, but there are some things you can bring in and you can even fashion more to be more like Christ and more godly so that you can be a good leader within the church or in your own home as a, you know, husbands are supposed to be the leaders of their home, spiritual leaders of their home. How can you lead your wife and kids um, unto to God's glory, leading them to good things, to biblical things. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. That's another thing. Some people, I mean, well, let's say it like this. When someone's hurting and they need a shoulder to cry on, they need someone to be there with them. Some of us can't do more than five minutes because it just, it brings us down. We don't know what to say and we just kind of get stressed out. And we just need to get out of the room. Others of you, as God gifts you with these things, he's going to give you a gift of mercy where you can be the person who can be at a dozen funerals and it doesn't harm you. You can be the person who shows up to someone's house to cry with them when there's been some tragic event or when they've heard some, a bad diagnosis, you know, you can bring mercy and cheerfully bring mercy to them just to be there for them, to love on them. It also has to do with the way that we rebuke or we discipline people so that they get out of their sin. Well, we need to do that in a way that's merciful. We don't just beat people over the head with scripture telling them that they're so bad and they need to change. There's got to be a way that we mercifully, lovingly, you know, even politely, we could say, bring them to a place within their walk where they change. Now, if you've just received the Lord, this might all be so much for you. You're just thinking, that's too much. I don't know where I'm going to be, what I'm going to be doing in the church. I just started going to church. 
that's okay. These are just things to uh, bring, introduce you to so that as you grow in the Lord, you can be praying, God, what do you want me to do for you? How can I serve you? How can I serve my brothers and sisters in the church and grow in a way that honors him? Now, next thing I wanted to do with our remaining time here is go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of the church. That's when the church first started. Jesus died and resurrected. And then 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, Penta means 50, 50 days after, uh, there was a, another festival, another Jewish feast. Jesus rose again on the day of first fruits. That's that. He, he died, you know, just after Passover. Then it was the day of first fruits. And then 50 days is Pentecost. Well, each one, the Lord did something specific on them, those celebration days. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they're all together with one accord in one place. Jesus is already resurrected and ascended to heaven. These are the disciples. They're gathering together. And it says this, that suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire as one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Okay, let me explain something. There are lots of good churches out there that get something wrong. They begin to teach something wrong where they say that this is how the church started. And so if you don't get filled with the spirit and speak in tongues, you're not really saved. But that's not what we talked about in our last video, right? We're saved by faith. We're saved by the grace of God who saves us. Nothing we do after that is the... Um, the, 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 the irrevocable sign from God that we've been saved. What we have here is a specific story about how God decided to start the church. They were filled with the Spirit and they began to speak in tongues. They spoke other languages um, that the Spirit allowed them to do. This is a wonderful thing. And that gift still exists, but it is, as we read in 1 Corinthians, it's kind of like we just read in Romans, it's a measure of grace given to some people and not to others. You can be saved and not speak in tongues. So don't even worry about that if that is brought to you. Nothing we do uh, saves us. No work can make us saved. And after we're saved, no specific thing proves that we're saved. No sign from anything. It's just simply that if we grow in our love for God and our love for people, that's what Jesus said, that we would know that people would know us by our fruits the fruit of love and joy and peace in the way we treat people, not by speaking in tongues or foretelling the future or anything else. So it goes on, it says, they were uh, dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. When the sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. So this is how God decided to start his church by reaching people from all different places. And they were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, aren't, are not all these men Galileans? Now, what happens here is that we have Peter's sermon. Peter, the apostle Peter stands up. He preaches this amazing sermon about who Jesus is and how um, it's God's will that they would, you know, know him and love him as the, as the Messiah. Um, where is it? Uh, he quotes from David and Joel and all these different places in the Old Testament. And what he wants them to do is see who Jesus is. This is the same kind of message that maybe you heard, received the Lord, and now you're watching this video. So look at this. He ends the sermon saying, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, the Savior, right? And it says, They were cut to the heart uh, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? So they were cut to the heart. They had this, um, this emotional, spiritual, internal moment. The word of God has been preached to them. It cuts to their heart. They believe now. And they say, what should we do? Now that we know this truth, they're going to act on it. Well, what's in the middle there? It's their faith. <laughs> they can't act on something that they don't believe is not true, right? That they, that they believe isn't true. Because they heard the truth, believe it, and now they want to act on it. And so what are they told to do now that they believe? Repent, which is to turn around, to, to 180 kind of turn away from your sins, 
To repent is to, to say, I used to cuss, now I'm not going to. I used to uh, you know, sleep around, now I'm not going to. I'm going to change my ways. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Okay, so say no to your sins, get baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This was the call from God, that if you truly have heard the truth, and you truly believe the truth, and you truly want to act on the truth, then this is what you should do. Turn from your sins and get baptized. So we're going to go over six points here in this little chapter on the practical things of Christianity, things that we live up to, things that we live by God's grace for. First one is that we repent of our sins as Christians. We give up things that we know we shouldn't be doing any longer. Sometimes it may take us a while to fully overcome them, uh, but eventually, as God desires, we move on from things. When I was younger, I used to curse a lot. Every other word was a curse word. And it was by his grace that I saw that that was wrong, and I began to say no to it. And slowly but surely, my tongue was purified, if we could say. Uh, there are other things that we do that we have to realize that God is calling us to say no to and change. Second thing that you Christians do is Christians get baptized. So I want you to be praying about when the Lord is calling you to get baptized. What in the Old Test in the sorry in the New Testament, when every believer got saved, baptism was something they did within days or weeks of getting baptized. They didn't wait years and years and years. Baptism was that outward sign, that kind of symbolic ceremony that said to everybody, "Hey, I believe, and I'm going to show you that I believe by getting in the water." They go under and they come back out. And it's this symbolic way of saying Jesus died and rose again. And so now that I believe with him, and I believe in him, I've died to my old life and I've come to a new life in Jesus. And so I want you to be praying about getting baptized. And if you want to, just let me know and we'll baptize you. It's an exciting thing. <clears throat> Baptism doesn't save you, right? We talked about that. We're only saved by grace through faith. But it's not saving, it's more showing people. Now, there's plenty of people who got baptized who weren't really saved. And that's, you know, that's just how things go sometimes. But if you truly know Christ, then you're going to want to get baptized. And they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking of Bread, and Prayers. And so I'm going to take these uh, one by one, starting with the Apostles' Doctrine. So what is doctrine? Well, doctrine is simply the word for teaching. Teaching. Doctrine is teaching. Uh, the doctrines of Scripture are the teachings of Scripture. It's just a kind of a Bible-style word for that. Psalm 119.11 says this, Your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Why do we want to know the teachings of Scripture? Well, it helps us not to sin against God. It teaches us the things we need to know so that we can walk with God purely and holy. Uh, another thing that we need to know about the teaching of Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 17, says this, But you, Paul the Apostle, teaching Timothy, his younger kind of a son in the faith, not really his blood son, but someone he's mentored over many years and discipled, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. So he's talking about the Old Testament, right? You've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. Wise for salvation, knowing, right? Wisdom, knowing how to be saved through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. How are we saved? Simply by faith in Jesus. And then it says all Scripture, everything that God has given us that we call Scripture, the Old and the New Testament, is given by the inspiration of God. Literally, that's the Greek word saying God breathed, that God breathed it out and is profitable or useful, we could say. Profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, reproof, that's pointing out what's wrong, correction, telling you how to do it right, and instruction in righteousness, training you to do it right for the rest of your life, to be righteous. That the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So scripture grows us. The teaching of scripture that it says that the, the 
early church, the first church, devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. They committed themselves steadfastly to it. That's what makes us able to do good works for God. Isn't that great? It helps us to learn the right things, point out things that are wrong in our own thinking, change what we've been thinking or doing, and then grow in righteousness to be more like Jesus. So, then we have breaking of bread, which most people call communion. That's what it's, you know, traditionally been called. Breaking of bread is communion. Matthew 26, 26 through 30 says this, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So this is the last supper. This is the Passover meal right before Jesus is arrested and crucified and then resurrects. He's sitting with his disciples and he says, take, eat, of the bread. This is my body. Now, it's not literally his body. And even now, as we take communion at church on a Sunday morning, we're not eating human flesh. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not what we're doing. We're eating a cracker, or a piece of bread that symbolizes his body. Take it, eat, consume, take it into you, have, you know, connection with it is the idea. Be one with Christ. It is his body. And another passage says that it's broken for the sins of the world. Then he took up the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Again, this kind of wiping away of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when he had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the bread and then the wine. The wine is to represent the blood of the new covenant, this new agreement that God has with men, that they would just simply know him and love him by faith and grace. This is what he's doing. He broke his body as the sin sacrifice, and he gave his blood so that we could be saved. So when we take communion, what we're literally doing is we're reminding ourselves of what Jesus did in the past, and we're reminding ourselves that Jesus is coming again. It's not literal blood. And even at our church, we don't take actual wine. We take grape juice because some of our members in the fellowship could have, you know, trouble with alcohol. We don't want to get anybody um, in trouble. So we just do grape juice. And while we do this, we're just reminding ourselves of the goodness of God to send Jesus to die and to resurrect. The, the, the payment for our sins and the proof of the payment was accepted. Communion, if you dedicate yourself steadfastly to the breaking of bread communion, what you're doing is you're dedicating yourself to remembering what Jesus did often and knowing that he's coming again. And the other one was prayer. And I want to say three things on prayer. First, a good way to pray is to help yourself, you know, because sometimes we start to pray and we don't know what to say. You could pray through adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication the word acts, which is a name of the book of the Bible. So that kind of helps us remember adoration. Start off your prayers by saying, you know, Holy Father in heaven, I'm just, you're so good to me. I, I love you. Thank you for your goodness. You're so merciful to me. And thank you for the scriptures. And you, you're a holy God. You're a mighty God. You know, just kind of talk about how good he is to him. Because it's, it's helpful for our own hearts to just adore God and to to talk to him out of love. Then confession, you know, repenting of your sins is confession. You talk to the Lord and say, you know, I, he already knows what you've done. So you don't, you don't have to, you can't hide it. But confessing it to him just kind of gets you on the same page with God that you agree with him that it was wrong and that you're gonna change. By his grace, you're gonna change. Thanksgiving, there's a lot of things to be thankful for before we get to supplication, which is the technical term for asking for things from God. You want to tell them about how thankful you are for what you do have before you spend time asking for more things, more blessings, more you know, change. Uh, oftentimes people treat prayer like, um, like a wish list, like talking to God like he's Santa Claus. I'd like this for Christmas and I want this for, you know, in my life. And I want this and this and this, right? Um, prayer isn't sitting on Santa's lap asking for, you know, presents. Prayer should be a lot more adoration, confession, and thanksgiving before supplication. If you can make each of these, you know, two minutes here, two minutes here, two minutes here, two minutes here, if you can make it that kind of equal, 
prayer life, very balanced prayer life, you'll be really growing in the faith. Here's a verse on prayer out of Colossians. It says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Right? We just talked about that. Meanwhile, praying for us, also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So Paul the Apostle, again, writing to the church in Colossae, the Colossian people, he says, pray for me. You know, be praying and pray diligently, vigilantly, not absent-minded, not half asleep, right? Be vigilant in your praying with thanksgiving and pray for me. <laughs> it's okay to ask for prayer. Even the apostles asked for prayer. He says, pray for me that God would open doors up so that I could preach who Jesus is, for which he's in chains. Paul's actually in prison for preaching, and now he's praying that he could get out of prison and keep preaching. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, I want to be able to pray for people, and I want to be open to having people pray for me. That's a really good thing. Now, just bonus here, I'll throw in here worship, because uh, worship, kind of songs and praise, singing songs at the church, worship is basically prayer set to melody. We sing to God about him or adoring him, thanking him for who he is. And even some of the worship songs are even asking that God would, you know, draw near to me and that I could, you know, change in my life. Worship is um, prayer to melody. And last but not least, we have fellowship. Here's a good verse on fellowship. What fellowship is, is that community we were talking about. We're one body in Christ. We're one people in Christ. Our local church is just an expression of the, the church at large where there's Christians all over the world. Well, what I want for you to have is a good idea about this connection you have. It's fellowship. It's not just friendship or friendship. I could talk to another Christian brother about movies and TV and our favorite music and our sports teams for hours. That's good friendship. But fellowship is that deeper connection where you're not just two Christian people talking about the same subject, but you're talking about Christ. You're growing each other in Christ. Fellowship is what Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, just like you would, you know, sharpen two knives together. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. You grow people, you help people, you change people, and they change you. They help you. They grow you as you get deeper in your walk with Christ alongside other people. So when the apostles dedicated themselves, it says they, they baptized the people and these people received the truth. What, what they continued steadfastly in was the apostles' teaching, the doctrine, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. That's what they dedicated themselves to continuously. You repent and get saved, you know, once. You get baptized once. But you continue to repent on and on and on. You continue to grow in teaching. You continue to fellowship and break bread and pray on and on and on. You continue in those things. You get saved in a moment, but you do the saved life forever after that. And what I want to encourage you in is to notice that fellowship, this community of Christians, it's the only way you learn the Apostles' Doctrine is if you have someone teaching you, and then you can teach others. The only way you can take a communion, breaking bread together, is when you're with other people, fellowshipping. You can take communion on your own, and it's a beautiful thing to do, but there's just something about being in corporate prayer, corporate worship, corporate um, teaching. You know, who's going to pray for you if you're all alone and you have no fellowship? Who's going to teach you things if you don't know anybody and you don't go to any churches and you only stay home and watch online? You know, how, how are you going to get to know the Lord Jesus through it? the best example of him is the people who are being changed by Jesus all the time, the church. And really, if you want that um, teaching, reproving, correcting, training in righteousness out of Second Timothy, you need fellowship. Who's going to correct you if you're wrong? Not that they should be all excited about correcting you, but who's going to help you grow if you're always alone? Who's, who are you going to break bread with? Who are you going to pray with if you don't fellowship? 
Now, there's a lot of other things that we could talk about, but really just trying to give you that immediate foundation for your walk with Christ. Reading your scriptures, praying, going to church, fellowshipping. Those are the things that you need to dedicate yourself to forever now. Because that's what makes the Christian life. I hope that you've been encouraged. I want to pray for you. And please, please, please reach out to Calvary Chapel Tracy through calvarytracy.org. There's a menu, a contact us tab. If you have any prayer requests, any needs, um, you know, this video might be five years old by the time you see it. But we're still open to you know, talking with anyone who comes to know the Lord and wants to grow in their faith. Let me pray for you. Lord, we pray that uh, this video would be used for your glory to edify many, many people, to, uh, to help many, many people. I pray, God, that you would share this video with the people who need it, Lord, and that they would join our church or another church that teaches the scriptures where so they can grow, where they can fellowship, where they can be prayed for and pray over others. Lord, we pray that every new believer would grow in their faith by your grace. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys and take care.